one thing to be clear on is that you, when you put your facts into the record in the complaint or counterclaim, you must list them individually. Or the opposition can deny your whole statement if only one statement is contained. In other words, if you're going to make one long treatise that's uh, three pages long, if there's one item in there that's, that they don't agree with and they deny, they can just say, I deny, for the whole thing. So we're going to have an example of how it should look. You have the judicial cognizance, which is the court takes notice of the following. And what I'm pointing out is here you have Line one, you just make simple statements. This constitutional court takes judicial cognizance and decrees as follows. Two, judicial cognizance, three, four, five. So you make single statements of on such and such a date, I received a letter from the bank stating uh, that there was a debt owed to them of so, many, so much money. See, that's a fact. And then when they, when they, they have to answer that or lose. And the answer would be, I admit, I deny, or I have no knowledge. So if they say, I, I admit that we sent you a letter on that time, well, of course they're going to admit it because you got a copy of it, and they're going to be liars if they don't, you understand? <clears throat> so you have to individually notate your, your points, because that way, when they do an answer, they're, you're, you're going to use their answer against them, right? So it should be in the form of a noun, verb, subject, i.e., one, on or about June 4th, 2010, alleged Officer Dandy issued a citation for speeding to John Doe in all capital letters. Two, on or about July 16th, the Superior Court of Wonderland sent a notice to appear, re-citation number, blah, 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 to John Doe in all capital letters. Now, you know, each item is going to list individually so that the opposition has a chance to address each individual item and that's how you're going to get information to use against them from their own statement, which is going to be in the form of an answer. If they fail to answer it, they lose. Next time, the next thing to do in statutory law court is to, f is to file any motions. Motions are a plea to the court to move the court. The court sits there like a feather on an ocean, and it doesn't do anything until somebody asks it to, allegedly. Okay. So when the DA puts in a complaint, then that's when the court can do something. So motions are, you are going to try to move the court to act and to judge whether their suit should be dismissed, should be stricken, should be adjusted or changed, etc. Since this the, isn't actually a court and it's an arena with players rather than, the, rather than the judge, it's a common misconception that the judge is the court. The true definition of the court is court, an agency of the sovereign created by it directly or indirectly under its authority consisting of one or more officers. And we read that earlier. You could file a motion to dismiss, re-right to a speedy trial, let's say, if they have violated the code and they are bound to honor it. That states if they haven't started the trial within 30 days following the arraignment or the arrest, the case be dismissed. So you would put the evidence into your motion showing a summary, the facts, the law, and the conclusion. Summary, the facts, the law that supports your right to get the decision you want, and then your conclusion of law. A motion can be filed to avoid filing an answer, which is quite common because, let's put it this way, he who's right wins in court. The truth is what wins. Lies and deceit don't win. So if, you're, if you have a winning case, and you know most of the time you will if you know what you're doing, I mean, unless you're a bad person and have actually trespassed upon somebody else's rights, you're going to win. So what's the other side going to try to do? Keep your evidence out. A motion can be filed to avoid filing the answer. So what's the first thing they're going to want to do? Not put any evidence into the file where they, they could be uh, found guilty of fraud and sent to prison. So they're going to try to avoid answering it, whether it's true, you know, the answer is I admit, I deny, or I have no knowledge. So if they have to admit to things, they're not going to like that. And if they say they deny it and you prove that they were guilty before, they're in trouble. So they're going to file a motion. 
The opposition will be keen on dismissing your suit and not answering the points you have presented and, are, and be bound by their statement. So they will immediately issue a motion to strike or motion to dismiss. And hope their good buddy and co-conspirator in crime, i.e. the judge, will squash you and your rights like a bug and protect them from having to be responsible and answer the charges against them. When they put a motion into the record, they will have to mail you a copy and you will have 21 days to write a reply to their motion and have it heard at a motion hearing. You will call your document, quote, opposition to motion to strike or opposition to motion to dismiss or whatever their motion is. In it, you will start off the same. Comes now John Doe, one of the people of the Republic of California, in this court of record to oppose the motion to strike to wit. One, Chase Manhattan has no jurisdiction nor authority to issue a motion as they have not proven any standing to appear or speak. In other words, if you don't have the right to speak, if you don't have standing, then you can't, you can't present anything. You can't be heard. First, you have to demonstrate that there's some kind of loss that you're, that you're, uh, that you're claiming and have not presented a proper claim upon which relief can be granted. Two, the attorneys Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, who entered the motion, have not shown any evidence of a power of attorney to represent the alleged plaintiff, Chase Manhattan Bank. Three, the attorneys have not demonstrated any license to practice law issued by the state of California to represent a legal entity. Now you notice I could have put those two in the same, in the same number, right? But I want the, them to have to answer each individual position I'm making. So you can uh, it, use issues that are defective in, and also the case law they cite is always worth looking up at Find Law or Google to see if, what the case is about. In other words, if they put a motion to strike in and they cite some court cases, most of the time they're bogus. I mean, they, they, it's, they may be real court cases, but the things that they're talking about, the issues they're talking about in those court cases don't apply to you. So, you. so it's a good idea to read those court cases and bring up the fact that that court case doesn't apply to your case. Don't make this a huge effort, as no judge will read a long paper and doesn't care about you anyway. You only have to present the issues and object to the motion. That's all. I don't expect the judges to be anything but corrupt when they are ruling against the people in favor of their paycheck. I mean the state and their true masters, the bankers, who are supplying the paycheck. Now and then you will find an honest judge, God bless him, who believes in equity and fairness. He will still have a hard time seeing the truth that there is no money and will not believe the bankers are violating the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Sections 8 and 10 and that there really is no authority to create money or cre credit from thin air. When the magistrate rules against you, you can vacate his ruling with a writ of error and order to show cause, which he will hate, as it is work, and he really has no legitimate reason for ruling against you. And he's not likely to put any reasons why, you know, there's... You have to use points and authorities which are previous evidences of the law, supply Court case sites, you know, Supreme Court case sites are great, but local court case sites will work. That have to, you know, that are issued, opinions that are issued that support your right to do what you did. So, that, so you think the judge is going to supply you with a research, all that? He's a busy guy. He's fleecing people right and left in court, and he doesn't have time to deal with your case. After you've challenged jurisdiction and they have failed to prove Proof of show proof of claim of having jurisdiction, you write a writ of prohibition to stop the inferior court from proceeding. How do you know it's an inferior court? If it's not operating according to the qualities of a court of record, proceeding according to the common law, a requirement in California Constitution under Article 6, Section 1, which I read to you pri previously, the writ of prohibition has to be filed prior to a trial and not after. So a writ of prohibition, how do you know if it's an inferior court? Well, if there's a court that's superior to it, it's inferior, right? Can an appellate court overrule the, the superior court in California? Sure. Can the Supreme Court overrule the appellate court? Sure. Does that make the appellate court and the, in, and the superior court inferior courts by definition? Sure. Why is a common law court 
a court of record, the highest court in the land. Because when a jury makes a decision, it can't be overturned even by the Supreme Court of, of the United States. Read the Seventh Amendment. The Seventh Amendment states, no jury decision can be overturned by any court in the land. So a court of record is one where the jury makes the determination and proceeds according to common law. And the judge can't make any rulings or determinations in a court of record. So when you go to court in the superior court and the judge starts making rulings and determinations and overthrowing and throwing out your, uh, your counterclaim or your, your claim, he's acting unlawfully. He has no authority to do that. At the end, put without prejudice by John Doe and send a copy of it off to proof of service to the opposition, that's to the lawyer for Chase Manhattan, or to the DA, and take the original wet ink proof of service and the original answer in wet ink to the court and bring a copy to get file stamped for your records as evidence you can use later in a complaint evidencing the bad behavior of the judge to the boss of the court personnel, i.e. judicial performance or the judicial counsel. The next thing to be aware of and should be done right at the beginning of having a case is that you have the right to discovery. This is really powerful stuff. To be able to find evidence that vindicates you and or cements your right to win. There are different ways of getting evidence, the, the first of which is anything in the public record is automatically admissible as evidence. The banks love this as the deed of trust is admissible without having anyone have to testify to the truth of it. See how deceptive that is? Hey, we went to the recorder's office and we got this deed of trust and the deed of trust says you owe us those, all this money and you can't question the deed of trust. The de deed of trust doesn't have to testify. The person who made the deed of trust doesn't have to testify. The fact that it was recorded in the public record makes it true. Oh, wow. So if I go down to the court of record and file a statement that the bank president is guilty of fraud, that makes it true just because I filed it? No. They're going to come after you for filing a fraudulent document, number one. Number two, your county recorder will never allow you to put things into the record and file things at the county recorder's office because they know how important they are. They are the gatekeepers of slavery. That's their job, to be the gatekeepers of slavery, the right to enslave you by keeping the public record only available to the slave masters. The minute you try to record anything, you get a bunch of lip about it. Put a lie into the record and no one can be sent to jail as there's no guilty party, only a dead corporate fiction. So when the corporation signs something saying that you owe money, can you actually send Bank of America to jail? It's a legal fiction. Bank of America, a piece of paper, a legal document, what are you going to put the legal document in a jail cell? That wouldn't have much effect, would it? But you put the CEO of Bank of America in a legal jail cell and, and you'll see you get a lot of action out of that. If you put a lie into the county recorder's office, that's a felony. But they do it. It's, oh well, you can't discover it because we, the court, will block you. You still have the right, however, to due process, which includes discovery, and there's no better tool than a subpoena ducis tecum, or an order from the court to comply with bringing the requested body, in other words, you're going to have the CEO of the bank, the body and the paperwork, or just the paperwork, to the court to be entered into the record at trial. You can subpoena the bank chief financial officer if you have sent him administrative remedy debt validation letters and he hasn't replied. Now he is a party to the case and he can be forced to testify. I mean, you're going to ask him, did you receive these letters? He's going to say, no. And you're going to say, well, I mailed them to you, care of the Bank of America. Are you saying that somebody at the Bank of America committed mail fraud and took your mail? and opened it by mistake. <laughs> and you can ask him relative questions he won't want to answer. So you can subpoena the original promissory note and the deed of trust to be brought by the bank president and testified to. You can subpoena the attorney general to testify to the constitutionality of the penal code or vehicle code that you're being charged with. You can require the other side to do a deposition, that's a sworn statement that's notarized, and answer your predetermined list of questions. 
or swear their answer in front of a notary.